Uh, we ask everyone when you have questions from the floor, if you could please come to a microphone so that we can all hear you and also record the conference. Uh, if you make a comment that you wish to have stricken or a slide that you wish to have stricken at the end of the conference, you can always contact us and we will do our best to edit the material. We've provided for internet access for everyone today in the room. Uh, there are instructions given both uh, by paper and by email. Uh, an email was sent out this morning. And we also, of course, remind you all to mute your electronic devices. For slide distribution, uh, this morning as well, an email was sent out with instructions for how to uh, log into the Dropbox. You'll also find that those instructions in your program book. Um, all of the uh, presentations that were submitted are there online now. The conference evaluation, uh, there was also an email sent out to all attendees. Uh, we encourage you to fill that out either during the conference or after uh, the conference as you choose. Uh, all meals will be served uh, in the salon today and tomorrow, uh, both lunch and breakfast. Uh, the format of each session for today, uh, each speaker in general will have 30 minutes to give a presentation. Panelists will then follow with 10 minute presentations each and then we'll have time for question and answer. The main deliverables for the conference are, of course, the 10 sessions over the next two days. We are publishing and disseminating a conference report. Uh, this recording and the slides will be made available to you after the conference. And in addition to the survey that we're sending out today, we hope to send a follow-up survey one year from today. This morning, we are going to start with patient-centered initiatives and addressing disparities, followed by lunch. Later, empowering women, hospital initiatives, state level initiatives, and we finish the day with national data collection. Tomorrow, research and antenatal corticosteroids and preterm labor detection starts the morning, followed by the role of preterm labor assessment, international initiatives, lunch, and in the afternoon, we'll have some summary recommendations, concluding remarks, and then uh, the March of Dimes has a Big Five meeting, uh, which will be at 2 o'clock following the Time for Action meeting. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is the lead funding agency for the conference, and Dr. Suchitra Iyer, Project Officer and Health Scientist Administrator, has gra graciously agreed to say a few words on their behalf. Let's welcome Dr. Iyer. Good morning. The Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is committed to supporting research that will help improve the health and healthcare of all by accelerating the use of evidence into clinical practice and healthcare policy development. Basically, it's evidence about what works best for whom and under what circumstance. Our focus is to ensure that patients, their families, healthcare professionals, and healthcare policy makers have the information that they need in order to make the informed healthcare decisions and are empowered to use it. On behalf of ARC, so the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is short formed to ARC. So on their behalf, I'm especially delighted to be here and support this initiative aimed at improving the outcomes of our littlest and perhaps most vulnerable patients, the premature babies. A leading cause of newborn death, preterm birth is associated with devastating complications that impact the health of children and their families throughout their lives. Antenatal corticoid steroid treatment offers an effective intervention to improve the survival and health of these babies, but yet it is not consistently utilized in the various healthcare settings. By bringing us all together, this conference offers a golden opportunity to engage in conversations on multiple levels on how to change the status quo and sustainably and consistently implement this evidence-based treatment into practice. I am indeed pleased to be part of this action, and along with me is my colleague, Beth Collins-Sharp. Beth, would you stand, please? 
And so on behalf of ARC, I extend a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Iyer. The March of Dimes is our conference co-sponsor, and we asked Dr. Burns, Senior Vice President and Deputy Medical Officer, to deliver some opening remarks on their behalf. Welcome, Dr. Burns. Thanks, Russ. So I'm sitting at a table all by myself right over here. So if anyone's looking for a seat, there are three seats. That always happens even at the March of Dimes office for some reason. Do I smell or something? I mean, what's the deal? Um, but we're, we're pleased to uh, be a co-sponsor of this conference. And uh, I think everyone knows the mission of the March of Dimes, which is to improve the health of babies by preventing um, birth defects, premature birth, and infant mortality. We actually just celebrated our 75th uh, birthday or anniversary just last year. You know, we started with a focus on polio and we've had our national campaign um, for 10 years plus now around preterm birth, um, although the whole rest of the mission um, is still very important as well. Um, uh, and so we've been taking that on. And oh, you know, last week we just had some preliminary data released from the National Center for Health Statistics. So after decades of increases in preterm birth rates, now we have seven years in a row where preterm birth rates have come down. In the U.S., it's now down to 11.4%. So thanks to you and all of your hard work, we're, we're making progress. So a clap for you guys, too. Um, I have my notes on my iPad for the first time. I've seen people do this, and it looked really cool, so I'm trying it, but I'm having a little bit of difficulty. Like, it's sliding down this really slick table here. Um, but it was like two years ago, Russ, that I think you gave me a call. Russ is a big march of diamonds volunteer in Massachusetts, and you've done a lot uh, there, so thank you for that. I know many of you here are March of Dimes volunteers, um, and if you're not, you will be before you leave. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but Russ called me. He said, I'm, we're, I'm applying for the, we're, we're sending this grant in to ARC, and you know, would you write a letter of support? And it really sounded like a, a really cool idea, and I, it's just so wonderful. You must, you must feel so good to have this finally come to fruition, and you worked very, very hard on, on, on this, so thank you for that. And I know that Russ is going to be doing lots of thanks as well, but of course I need to do some as well. In addition to ARC, I mean, there are many of you in this room, and Russ will, will go through uh, some of the other organizations who have helped make this possible. But we're here over the next two days to talk and act on antenatal corticosteroids, and um, I do want to give a shout out to the conference co-chairs and Milt Cottlechuck and Carla Damas, I haven't seen you yet, but I can't wait to see you and chat and catch up. She's hiding over there, by the okay. And Jeff Gould, who I just got to see for the first time in a while, and Jay Iams, all colleagues and mentors of mine, and a few others who made this possible, um, who are very modest people, including Russ and Catherine Morris and Kelly Ernst from the March of Dimes, who's sitting back there, who helped with all the logistics. So Russ asked me to point out some of the March of Dimes activities and what's going on, and so I just jotted down a couple because I know I always talk longer than I'm supposed to, so I'm going to try to make this relatively brief. Um, so we have been doing a lot of work around antenatal corticosteroids, and um, as you all know, and, and we have a guest here from the Joint Commission, it's been one of the five perinatal care core measures, I think since 2009, if I'm getting that date correct. I don't know if Celeste is in the room, but yes. Hi, Celeste. Okay, well, okay, so it's been a while, and, and we're going to keep that going. In terms of the March of Dimes, so it was back in 2010 that we published uh, Toward Improving the Outcome of Pregnancy 3, which is the third iteration of that monograph, first published in 1976, and the subtitle of that um, monograph, it's about 140 pages, is Enhancing Perinatal Health Through Quality safety and performance initiatives. And in one of the chapters, um, there was um, quite a bit of mention on the appropriate use of antenatal corticosteroids. And two of the authors of that, actually that chapter, are here at this conference, Dr. Iams and Dr. Oshiro. And then in 2012, uh, there was a, a global report that was published called Born Too Soon, Global Action Report on Preterm Birth. And this is a reminder that we can't do this alone meaning really any of us. We have to all do this together, and this is in the context of preterm birth, but one of the calls to action in that report was around the use of antenatal corticosteroids. When I talk about partnerships, this is the March of Dimes, the World Health Organization, Save the Children, the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, and many other groups. 
and you'll hear more about global efforts um, in this conference as well. And then just last year, the March of Dimes released the second edition of the Preterm Labor Assessment Toolkit. I see some of the authors right over there. It was first published in 2005. And that, again, was a partnership. So this is about partnership and collaboration. So you'll hear more about this from Mary Campbell Bliss and Herman Hedriana and Jim Byrne. I think that's tomorrow morning. But, you know, I need to mention, talking about Sutter Medical Center, Sacramento Maternal Fetal Medicine Group, Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, sorry, Jim, Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, and the Hospital Corporation of America. The last thing I wanted to mention is you're going to hear this term, Big Five. You already heard it. So what is the Big Five from the March of Dimes perspective? The Big Five are the five states that account for the largest numbers of births in this country, and it's close to 40 percent of births. And we've been working with the Big Five states for the last, gosh, seven years on various initiatives, including reducing early elective deliveries. And that group is here as well, and we have that post-conference meeting to talk about how we're going to implement as a group um, an initiative to increase the appropriate use of antenatal corticosteroids. And who are the big five states? California, Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. I was doing that counterclockwise in, in my head. So um, I do want to give a shout out, and then I'll, I'll, I'll be done, Russ, I promise, to the volunteer leads from those states who've been with us really right from the beginning. And I have to say that our maverick leaders have been Bill Sappenfield from Florida and Brian Oshiro from California. And now we have Ann Borders from Illinois, Marilyn Kasika, who's been with, with us for years from New York, Donald Dudley and, and Eugene Toy from, from uh, Texas. I could embarrass you and ask you to stand up, but I'm not going to do that. Um, should I make them stand up? No, I'm not going to do that. But, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention the March of Dimes staff leaders from each of those states. And um, the backbone of all this has been Leslie Kowaleski from our California chapter, along with um, Peyton Mason Marty, um, Fiona McKay from Florida, Medija Karishi from Illinois, Nelson Andino from New York, and Sharon Malatok from Texas. So. I would appreciate it if those big five leaders just stood up for a moment, and, and I'd like to clap for you. Could you do that for me, all of you guys? I mean, you, you talk about implementation. I mean, these, these, these guys proved that we could do it across multiple states when we reduced early elective deliveries. And um, thanks to Brian's leadership, Brian Oshiro, we actually published that, those results in the Green Journal. So we're here for this phase to act. And I'm going to hand it back to Russ. Thanks for having us here, Russ. <laughs> yes, somebody please join Dr. Burns. My introduction this morning has three parts. Part one, time for gratitude. Part two, time for inspiration. Part three, Time for action. Walking into this room was a victory for us because this event must be the largest and most diverse gathering of maternal child health, health experts to advocate for antenatal corticosteroid treatment in at least a decade. You have come as far as San Francisco, Seattle, Houston, Chicago, Albany, Toronto, and downtown Washington. We are grateful to all of you for the time, energy, and enthusiasm in participating in this conference. I would be remiss if I did not take a few minutes to thank a few specific individuals and organizations that have been crucial to the success of this event. First, I must thank my mother, Milton Kuddlechuk, and my father, Carla Damis. <laughs> yes, I meant that figuratively, of course, but no, I did not mistakenly reverse the roles. Milt has been my closest collaborator from the start, and like my mother, he has been there to guide me and pick me up after every bump and bruise. He has been the intellectual force behind the conference, and we would not be here without him today. Like my father, Carla inspires, and if needed, is not afraid to give a kick in the pants. She crystallized my thinking about the imperative for addressing the chronic disease of prematurity after a fabulous presentation a decade ago in 2004 at the March of Dimes Prematurity Summit in Boston. 
We would also not be here today without the leadership of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. They saw fit to make this conference a priority at a time, if you remember, when federal research funding was under great pro political pressure from the sequester. And if this conference is a three-legged table, then Scott Burns and the March of Dimes, our co-sponsors, have been the third leg. They were not only generous in their financial support, but have been assisting us all year with advice, planning, and preparations. In your program books, you will note that the conference and our cause received wide support from an array of individuals and organizations. But I must also specifically thank the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists for their platinum sponsorship and Hologic for their generous educational grant. And I would like to show our gratitude at the start for all the conference chairs and speakers. I know Scott covered a good fraction of them, but bear with me. Um, I believe most of you are in the room this right now. I hope you might stand as I call your name. Milton Cuddlechuck, Carla Damis, Scott Burns, Jay Iams, Jeffrey Gould, Carolina Reyes, Janice Spearman, Ronald Wapner, Mary Campbell Bliss, Herman Hedriana, Elizabeth McClure, and Michael Liu. Thank you. I too would like to uh, thank my sisters, Catherine Maris and Kelly Ernst, for their assistance with all the arrangement for the conference. And lastly, and if you will forgive me, most importantly, I must thank my wife, Gitanjali, my son, Neil, 16, and my twin sons, Amar and Avi, 11. Our family very much appreciates that we owe our lives and happiness to antenatal steroid treatment and in particular to the efforts that many of you championed one, two, and three decades ago. But we are not here just to thank my wife and children, but to learn from them. For in the world of healthcare quality improvement, the only thing worse than having a near miss is to not learn from it. For the second part of my, time, for my talk, Time for Inspiration, I am happy to introduce my partner of more than 20 years, Dr. Gitanjali Kerkar, co-founder and board member for Day Before Birth, clinical instructor in medicine at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and a Cornell, Harvard, UCSF trained gastroenterologist practicing in the Boston area. She is also the mother, I am biased to say, of the three best boys in the world. Please welcome Dr. Kerkar. Good morning, everyone. It is truly an honor to speak to this distinguished group today. I am a two-time survivor of HELP syndrome, one of the most severe forms of preeclampsia. As most of you in the room know, the challenge in managing patients with HELP is delivering the baby before the mother reaches the point of no return in the cascade of the disease. While our family supports research to find a cure for help, an even less visible tragedy is women who have obstetrical emergencies and fail to get the best available care. In particular, they fail to get antenatal steroids, a now 40-year-old treatment that has made such a difference in our family's life. While I am aware that I am a case study of only one mother I know from the literature and interactions with many families that our story has themes that are common to many. In 1997, during my pregnancy with Neil, I started developing contractions in my 37th week. And when I arrived at Cal Pacific with regular contractions, a very astute nurse, Shirley Kendall, recognized that I was weaker than most women in labor. She encouraged the attending physician to order labs. When the attending shared the results, I can only begin to convey the tsunami of thoughts that followed. Unlike most women, I did not have the luxury of absorbing the diagnosis slowly. After going through med school, residency, GI fellowship, and a transplant liver rotation at UCSF, I knew I had HELP syndrome. I had help, 
my baby needed to be delivered fast, my low platelet count and elevated prothrombin time made a C-section dangerous. I had already gotten an epidural, which was probably a bad idea given the coagulopathy. I did the only thing I could. I spoke to my son in utero. I asked for his assistance, took a dose of Pitocin, and pushed. Neil was born healthy within hours, and I spent a week in the hospital where I was put on magnesium to prevent seizures, and eventually my labs improved. As you can imagine, after such an experience, we were very cautious about whether or not we should have any more children, but after reading the literature and discussing the issue with my colleagues, we concluded that the chance was low, less than 4% that help would reoccur. Of course, the literature said nothing about help followed by a spontaneous conception of monochorionic diamniotic identical twins. So in 2002, during the pregnancy with my twins, I had at least three things going for me. First, I had near professional level knowledge of the warning signs of potential complications of pregnancy. Second, I had one of the best obstetricians, high-risk obstetricians, Aviva Lee Peretz, then at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And third, I had already survived help. Just before Memorial Day in 2002, 20 weeks into the pregnancy, I was diagnosed with an incompetent cervix and required a cerclage. I stopped working so I could stay home on bed rest. At about 8 p.m. on Tuesday night, October 15th, in my 32nd week of pregnancy, I was feeling worse than the usual aches and pains. And although I did not have a history of high blood pressure, I decided to measure my blood pressure as I had been doing during the previous weeks. Using a 30-year-old blood pressure bestowed upon us by my father-in-law, a retired cardiologist. I got a high reading, and then the cuff broke. <laughs> so I did what any sensible physician would do. I sent my husband out to Walgreens to get another blood pressure cuff. <laughs> of course, what we did not realize was that the clock to treat with antenatal steroids was already ticking. So Russ drove to Walgreens to get a cuff minutes before the store closes and returns to me, though sicker, dutifully measures my blood pressure and gets another high reading. It's now about 9 p.m. I finally call my obstetrician who tells me to come to the emergency room at the Brigham straight away. Now at the time, for those of you from Boston, we lived in Newburyport, about an hour away from Boston, and we needed to find care for my then five-year-old son, Neil. We planned that my cousins would be the designated emergency caregivers, but we didn't want to trouble them to drive into Boston. So first, we drive out to Newton, and then arrive at the hospital at 11 o'clock. To the credit of the Brigham and Women's Hospital, I am seen within minutes by an attending physician and given my first dose of corticosteroids. So, while it seems comical in retrospect, here we had a team of highly educated mother and father, and we had just burned three hours getting to the hospital for an illness we know is potentially life-threatening to both me and my unborn twins. And we know or should have known that those three hours might have made the difference between the antenatal steroids working or not. On the other hand, if we did not have the experience, the knowledge, the sensitivity to potential warning signs, we might have just stayed home and not gone to the hospital on Tuesday evening. Once at the hospital, the Brigham team was brilliant, really brilliant. At first, they mainly monitored me, hoping the help would progress slowly enough so that the steroids would be on board for sufficient time to take effect and perhaps give some additional precious time for the baby's lungs to mature. Thursday night, nature took its turn. One of the twins started showing signs of distress and I began having trouble breathing. 
After weeks on bed rest, the team feared that I had a pulmonary embolus and a spiral CT was ordered. To everyone's relief, this was negative. As we later realized, help can result in both diminished renal function as well as leaky capillaries resulting in pulmonary edema. So I was treated both for bronchospasm and pulmonary edema. And by Friday morning, I was stable enough to deliver Avi and MR, now almost 60 hours after receiving corticosteroids. Avi and MR were born with functioning lungs and only spent 10 days in what is called the feed and grow section of the NICU. Of course, the benefits of antenatal steroids is statistical. In 1,000 treated mothers, Antenatal steroids will save 17 lives and 55 cases of RDS, or respiratory distress syndrome. So we will never know, in our case, whether Avi and Amar's lungs were already mature at 32 weeks or whether the steroids did the trick. The point is, when so much is on the line, doesn't every infant and every mother deserve the best possible treatment? For us and thousands of other families in the US and worldwide, the days before birth, the days when pregnancy complications must be realized and antenatal steroids must be initiated are the most important days in our lives. As someone who owes almost everything to obstetrical care and innovation, I implore you to assure that all premature babies receive the best possible treatment. I wish you all a very successful conference and thank you so much for your attention. Back to Russ. The third part of our talk is time for action. After the birth of our twins, Gitangela and I began to think about what we had learned from the experience and how, I, how we might assist in the cause to prevent, detect, and treat preterm birth and complications. After working with a March of Dimes and talking to many leaders, we decided to focus on antenatal steroid treatment as an area that was ripe for renewed energy and effort. So a few years ago, Gitangeli and I, along with Milt Kuddlechuk, founded the public charity Day Before Birth with a specific mission of advocating for opportunities to improve the quality of care in the days before birth, particularly antenatal steroid treatment, and thereby strengthen the health of babies and mothers. I probably do not need to remind this distinguished group that it has been more than four decades since Liggins and Howey published the first randomized controlled trial showing that antenatal corticosteroid treatment significantly reduces rates of respiratory distress syndrome. And many of you in this room are directly responsible for disseminating and using the treatment to save many of thousands of cases of respiratory dist distress syndrome and many thousands of lives in the United States and around the world every year. Three of those lives are my sons. Yet here we all are 40 years later knowing the dream is unfulfilled. It is time to act towards a renewed national effort to make antenatal corticosteroid treatment a national priority for perinatal care. It is time to act for social justice. Our nation was founded on the principle that all people are created equal. The truth is only about half of eligible mothers receive a full course of antenatal steroid treatment, only about half. And consequently, some infants are born healthy and some are not. In spite of our best efforts, some infants are not created equal. Some children are left behind from the very start. It is time to act for social justice. While it is true that some patients are beyond the help of our current knowledge and systems, it is also true that one of the reasons patients fail to get treatment is because we have underinvested in perinatal research and care. If we are willing to spend $10,000 on a cardiac treatment to extend the life of a 60-year-old for 10 years, 
then we should be willing to spend $80,000 on a perinatal treatment to extend the life of a neonate for 80 years. The healthcare system in the U.S. and around the world still falls short in valuing economically the lives saved through perinatal care. It is time to act for social justice. While it is fruitful to debate whether young mothers have made good personal decisions about their health or whether institutions have designed good health care systems, we should not debate end endlessly. The cost of inaction is the suffering of babies and mothers and families. Now, admittedly, it is somewhat easier to know that we need to act than to know what to do or how to do it. And for many of the topics we will discuss over the next two days, we don't yet know the what to do or the how to do. But we hope you will view the next two days as a working meeting, a chance to reflect on this important topic, a chance to share ideas, a chance to begin new collaboration. Ultimately, our goal is to create a set of comprehensive re recommendations, an action plan that we plan to publish and disseminate. After much collaborating with Milton, Cuddlechuck, and distilling discussions with conference chairs and many advisors, I would like to get us started with some elements and themes, a vision of what we would like to see in the action plan. If you were to envision a community five or ten years from now, in the U.S. or abroad, what would you want to see them do to receive a grade of A plus for their efforts to increase appropriate usage of antenatal corticosteroid treatment? Here is our initial answers to this question. An A plus act community would institute a comprehensive quality management system with root cause analysis that address factors both in the hospital and in the community. It would empower women to know the warning signs and ask for act. It would establish an evidence-based system for preterm labor assessment for all pregnant women with warning signs. It would measure act success rates in addition to treatment initiation. It would reach all pregnant women regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic background. It would extend services geographically so treatment rates in community hospitals are comparable to those in tertiary ones. It would sustain itself financially, and it would serve as a model and disseminate its programs, policies, and research. We hope many of you will pick up on these themes and elements and debate them directly or indirectly through the conference. In 1958, Mar Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. I think we should echo his wisdom when we think about improving rates of antenatal steroid treatment in particular and maternal child health care in general. True health care is not merely the absence of disease. It is the presence of wellness. It is time to act. Indeed, it is time to act. Thank you.